Welcome to Focused on Forward. The purpose of this podcast is to focus on recovery from life situations, be it a disease, chronic or acute, perhaps the loss of someone so dear to you in death, or a change of life patterns that has affected you so profoundly that you have no choice but to find your new normal and become focused on moving forward. Each episode is designed to show the positivity that people bring to each and every one of their stories, the successes they've had, ways that they have become so definitively focused on moving forward. We look forward to sharing their stories, and we hope that they inspire you just as much as they have inspired us. Thanks for listening, and enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome to Focused on Forward. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Richard Bergen. Richard's a a cool story, and I think you guys are really going to enjoy this. Uh, Richard has a a level of high-functioning autism known as Asperger's syndrome. Now, for many people, uh, there's uh, a lack of understanding as to what Asperger's is, how it affects our daily life, and, you know, what you can and cannot do uh, with someone as someone with a high functioning form of autism. So I'm excited to have Richard on because not only is, is he have a cool story and he's going to help, uh, shed a line, uh, a light rather on a few things that maybe we're not familiar with, but I'm also excited because Richard's a filmmaker and a little bit, in a few minutes, we're going to talk about a film that he and his company have put together. And, uh, so I think you guys are going to want to stick around for that and hear that as well. So Richard, thank you so much for being on our show today. You're very welcome, Tim. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, we're, we're excited. Uh, this, we're looking forward to this conversation. So what I'd like to do, Richard, is I'm just going to turn the floor over to you. And uh, please, if you would, take us through uh, a little bit of your life and, and, and uh, you know, what you do on a day-to-day basis and kind of go from there. Well, what I do on a day-to-day basis, I do kind of have a set routine that I follow a lot of the time, but I could also be very impulsive other times, so it really depends. But in general, I would say that, you know, if I would say, like, what is the biggest uh, misconception that people have about, you know, somebody who has Asperger's syndrome is that, you know, it's not like an intellectual disability. You know, I have, you know, I I have, like, I I don't want to brag, but I do have a very high IQ. I'm not quite at a genius level, but I'm like I'm like a couple points shy of being a genius. So I've always, you know, I've I've had a lot of doubts in my life, but that's not really something I've doubted. But and one thing that I would say that it's like kind of the way my brain is wired is that I tend to focus very intensely on like one thing at a time, which could be both good and bad, you know, with what they call hyper focus is like if I'm hyper focused on something I'm supposed to be doing, you know, that's great. I can do it very thoroughly and intensely, and I'm just in the zone for several hours straight. But if I'm hyper focused on something I'm not supposed to be doing, that's bad because what I'm supposed to be doing doesn't get done because I'm hyper focused on the wrong thing. <laughs> That makes sense. Okay. (laughs) So with your, with your Asperger syndrome, uh, does it um, affect your ability to communicate your points with people? I think so. Yeah. I mean, well, well, I've gotten a lot better socially, you know, when I was younger, when I was a kid, you know, I was not uh, very uh, well adapted to my environment. I was I was actually fairly popular when I was really young, like in elementary school. But then, as a teenager, I was you know pretty. I went from being unpopular to outcast to just being kind of like depressed loner, who kind of fits into that cliche of you know, being somebody who's on the uh, watch list because you're afraid he's going to snap. So I went very kind of, so I went down in popularity gradually as I got older. But, and I think part of that was because, you know, it is, they do describe Asperger's as being like a social 
disability. So I, I have always had, you know, some problems connecting with people, you know, making, you know, acting in a way that doesn't alienate the people around me. Although I think, and in a way, and this is something that can kind of benefit you when you're a writer is that, you know, one thing that I've always done is like, I've studied, you know, the people around me. And, you know, I've like watched different, you know, movies and TV and then studied that to get an idea of how people interact with one another. So it's like I study people and then I kind of try to copy their, you know, manners of speech and behavior. And so by doing that, I've gotten a lot better over the years. Okay. So, you know, I could see how that would be that could be a, a affect you in a social setting. Um, do, do, do social settings cause anxiety for you with, with people if there's more people around or do you prefer less people or, or how does that work for you particularly? Well, it really uh, depends on the people I'm interacting with. If I, you know, go to a party where I don't really know anybody there, then you know, I'm, you're gonna find me blending in with the wallpaper in the corner. <laughs> somewhere but <laughs> <laughs> understood okay yeah i do the same thing though no absolutely you know i think that, i think that's pretty universal for anybody who's introverted but you know if i'm with somebody i know and you know they know me and we're pretty cool with each other then you know i don't have any anxiety really then it's very kind of calm and normal for me okay good so you said that there was you had one misconception. What's another misconception that people have when it comes to dealing with autism at any level? You said there was the, the misconception about intelligence. Clearly, that's not an issue. No. Well, I think actually the other misconception would, would be kind of like at the opposite level, which is that people with autism are, you know, geniuses and have like superhuman math abilities. Like math was always my worst subject at school. <laughs> I've never, I've never really, you know, I like, I, I get numbers, you know, I'm good at like, you know, adding, subtracting, multiplying, you know, everything, everything from division and algebra and beyond is not my strong suit. <laughs> I think that anytime people uh, hear about uh, somebody with autism or somebody who's on the spectrum to some degree, they automatically, unfortunately, make the parallel to the movie Rain Man and that this person, oh, he has to be good at math. He has to be good at numbers because that's what they've seen in a, in a movie setting. And I think that's what people have become familiar with. So I think it's good for, uh, I think it's good for people to hear that, that that is not a true stereotype. I think it's good that people are able to know that, um, you know, this one area we can shed a light on that not everyone is Rain Man, uh, <laughs> you know. So clearly, that's that's a very good thing. So, in learning how to best cope with yourself and and be able to function on a day to day day to day basis, because you said there was a time where you went through uh, some depression and 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 really maybe having some some social ills there. What are some of the things that that Richard did to get himself from the point of of knowing that he had Asperger's, but to the point of acceptance and moving forward with it? Well, I think part of the problem for me was, you know, accepting it because there was definitely like a period, you know, kind of later in my teenage years where I was kind of at war with myself you know kind of feeling like like I went from not wanting to fit in when I was younger and that was actually when I was a little bit more popular because I was kind of like I was kind of like an 11 year old outlaw in a sense but when I was older I did want to fit in more and so I was kind of like I, I was kind of trying to convince myself you know I don't have Asperger's I'm just you know I don't know what I thought I had, but I try to convince myself, I don't have this, you know, I'm fine. I can, you know, I don't know what's wrong with everyone else, you know, for not accepting me. And so I was kind of, you know, very in 
denial. And then at a certain point, I realized that, you know, the more I read about it, because I had been diagnosed as a kid, and I, I wasn't really told much about what it meant when I was younger. And I remember when my mom told me I had it, you know, that was that was pretty upsetting to hear, you know, because then that's kind of I saw it as like, you know, I'm always going to have this thing, you know, that makes me different from everyone else. And that was like when you're when I was like six or seven, that was a pretty upsetting thing to hear. But I, I, I also didn't really know much about it when I was a kid. I just thought that, you know, well, these are this is just who I am. All these things are my unique personality quirks. And so when I was older, when I was at college and I was in denial about having it at that point, then I started to read more about what Asperger's is. I was like, okay, that sounds like me. Oh, that sounds like me. That's definitely sounds like me. And then I kind of realized, yeah, I, I do actually have it. I wasn't misdiagnosed. And now what I have is the high functioning version because, you know, there are many different Levels, right, there's different uh, steps to the, autism, to the scale. Absolutely, yeah. And like if you're a low-functioning autistic, you know, that if I was low-functioning, I wouldn't be having this conversation right now because I would be nonverbal. I wouldn't be able to talk. Sure. If I, if, yeah, if I was low-functioning, I would be just like sitting in a corner, you know, banging my head against something. I, I wouldn't be here right now. So I'm thankful to be as high functioning as I am, because when you're high functioning, you have fewer, you know, disabilities that are associated with it. And you're able to better capitalize on, you know, these strengths that come from having your brain wired in such a way. Okay, no, that's, a, that's a great answer. Oh, Absolutely. That's a great answer. So, yeah, so to me, I think with a so to to normalize this along with other things that people deal with, I think it comes down to identification and acceptance. You know? uh, I would agree with that. Yeah, because if when we talk about any other thing, we talk about mental health, we talk about uh, emotional health, we talk about all these other things. It comes down to identification and acceptance that we have to identify what is the root source of of, of whatever it is that we're going through, and then again, accepting it, because once we've accepted it, we've identified it. Now we know where to, to step off and where we, we go from here. So absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a, I have a few friends who have uh, either uh, autistic um, uh, siblings or children. Now, one of, uh, one of my former coworkers, her son, uh, also had Asperger's. He was about, he was uh, not as high functioning, but I noticed that he his mom would say something to him, kind of off the cuff, and we would say that it was uh, irony or, or sarcasm, and that was just, you know, he didn't understand irony or sarcasm. Is that something that you struggle with as well, or if somebody's trying to talking with you and they try to be a little sarcastic with you and and and, and jokingly or or is that something you're good with? Well, I, I've heard a lot of people with uh, autism say that they struggled with that, but I don't think I've really struggled with that. If anything, I would say I'm more sarcastic than my mom, and she's kind of struggled with my tone sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. All right. Um, yeah, because uh, he was a really nice kid. Don't get me wrong. I, I don't mean to make it sound like he, he wasn't oh, or he course. wasn't catching on. Uh, it's just that he had a hard time deciphering sarcasm from, from a normal tone. And so when we talk, we have conversations whenever he'd come into the office. Um, you know, as long as I kept the conversation on this kind of plateau, you know, no spikes either way, he could, you know, he'd follow along. We'd have great conversation and everything was fine. Uh, you try to slip a joke in and he, he would just kind of look at you, you know, kind of the crickets. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're, you'd hear crickets. Uh, well, I would say that I, I definitely, you know, struggled sometimes, you know, with understanding like the meaning of exactly what somebody is saying. You know, if it's like, I can't really tell, you know, it's like, are they trying to be friendly or are they making fun of me? That was something oh, I struggled yeah. with in school when I was younger. 
but I would say now, you know, as I've gotten older, you know, I've, I've learned a lot more about people. And I would say that generally I, I can understand everything that's being said pretty well. Okay. How about uh, dealing with sens uh, sensory overload? Is that something that you deal with or because again, depending on the the, where you're at on the autism spectrum, sensory overload could be a, a very big problem or it could Definitely, be, yeah. be a very minor problem. So where does that fall for you? Well, I would say it happens less often now than it did when I was younger. I can remember, you know, like, you know, when I was in school, you know, after getting home, after being at school all day, you know, I can remember like the kind of the buildup of all these sensory overloads. So if something went wrong when I got home, then I would get very upset very quickly because it had been building up for me throughout the day. But I would say now that I'm an adult and I'm kind of more in charge of things and I have, I have more kind of power and control over, you know, my life and my environment, I would say it happens less often now, but I can still have a meltdown if I get really frustrated and, you know, things build up and, but, but it doesn't really happen that often now compared to when I was a kid and I can control it much better now, you know, when, when I was really young, you know, you don't really have as much self-control at that age, regardless of how your brain is wired because you're a kid and, you know, kids are not known for self-control. No, not typically. <laughs> so I read an interview um, with a woman who, who was uh, autistic and she's like you, high functioning. Uh, uh, I, another comparison, very, very highly educated woman, very in, a uh, very intellectual woman. Uh, and she said that she was thankful that she had Asperger's. Uh, and the reason being is that she felt that it was a blessing in, uh, in her line of work. It allowed her to be more successful because she was able to focus on perhaps some of the smaller details of things uh, when it came to projects and jobs that other people could not. Now, you mentioned being hyper-focused earlier. Um, do you understand what she's trying to say? Oh, Is it oh, definitely. Yeah, that's always, it's like, I remember, you know, back when I was, you know, getting graded on things at school, I would almost always either do really well or really badly, depending on what I was doing. But, you know, it's like, so I would kind of like go through and kind of get mediocre grades that I would do like a stunningly good job on something that happened to catch my interest that my teachers would be shocked because they were like, I didn't know he could do that. And I'm like, well, now you do. <laughs> well, there it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah, so you, I, you uh, understand where she's coming from and you identify with that. That's cool. Uh, all right. So here's a question I like to ask all of my guests. Um, Looking back on the entirety of your life's experience, everything that you've gone through, what is the single greatest lesson that you have learned? I would say probably the single greatest lesson I have learned is that, you know, it's like you don't want to, you know, be mean to people. Based, I mean, basically to sum it up in one sense, like you don't want to like treat people badly on purpose because you can you can upset people perfectly well without trying a lot of the time you don't even know how much damage you're doing but I think you know if like you didn't mean to cause harm then you can generally salvage whatever damage you've caused if you go out like intentionally trying to hurt people then you know, you're causing like irreversible damage to your own reputation and your relationship with other people. I would say that's, that's the first thing that came to my mind anyway. No, I like that. That's good. I think, uh, and I think you agree, I agree with you that uh, it's easy enough nowadays, especially to, <laughs> offend, to offend somebody without trying. Uh, that seems to be a thing. The more, the older I get, the more I see that. Um, so I think, and I think you're right. 
if we go out of our way to be mean to people, we're going to do irrevocable damage. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. It's one thing where we can, we can, you know, Hey, they, they look at you and they go, you know what? Uh, uh, that's not ri how Richard normally acts or that's not how Tim normally acts. That's that they were having an off day or, you know, where they can scoop it up to that and we can say our apologies and move on. But uh, if they can look at that and go, well, that's just how he is. Yeah, that's a whole nother, whole nother deal. So another question I like to ask all my guests, and maybe uh, this will have a, a nice response like the last one. So another question I like to ask uh, my guest, Richard, is, is looking back, what's the best piece of advice that you were given? Best piece of advice that I was given? Well, yeah, that's whether... kind of a, that's kind of a, yeah, I was just, yeah, I was sad to think for a second because it's kind of, you know, I, I didn't actually get a lot of great... <laughs> Okay. Advice growing up, but I would say probably the best piece of advice I was uh, given was I remember the saying that my mom taught me, which she learned from her time in the Army Reserves, which was be prepared. Basically, so basically, whatever you're going to do, be prepared. I would say that's that is great advice because you don't want to, you know, do anything that you you're not really prepared for like sometimes you know you know you could be impulsive you can just want to go out and do something as it feels good but you have to kind of know what you're getting into regardless of what you're doing so if you're not really prepared then that can cause a lot of problems no i think that's good that's great advice actually oh, thank uh, you. i think i think sometimes the the best advice is short and sweet so i agree uh, with that definitely yeah so, okay, excellent. Well, now we've come to the part of the show where I want you to tell us all about your movie. Tell us about how you got into to movies and uh, what's going on and, and uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. That sounds good. Yeah, well, my movie is a psychological horror film. The title is Fang, and it is actually semi-autobiographical in a sense. The main character is autistic. He's He's lower functioning than I am. So it's kind of like, so when I was writing him, it's kind of like a more extreme version of myself in a lot of ways. And, and so his name is Billy Cochran. He's a janitor. He lives with his mother in kind of this gritty neighborhood in Chicago. And, you know, and because Billy has autism, he's very kind of alienated from the people around him. You know, he doesn't have a lot of friends. He, you know, he's kind of like, he works at this factory and the other, his co-workers aren't quite sure what to make of him. And he, his relationship with his mother is rather strained, to put it mildly. So, so one night, you know, Billy wakes up, he has to go to the bathroom, and then he finds this rat in the bathtub. And then the rat jumps out, it chases him around, and then it bites him. And so after Billy gets bitten by the rat, then he starts to feel like he's transforming into a rat himself. Yeah, that's the most I can say about the story without giving too much away. Fair enough. Okay. So how did you come up with the concept and all that kind of stuff? Well, I think that I, I don't really remember exactly where I got the uh, rat idea from, but I do think it, it does kind of work as a metaphor for the experience of being autistic because you know, if you look at like a, a rat, you know, they're, they're not really beloved by a lot of people. Rats are often seen as pests, you know, they're kind of at the fringes of society, kind of scurrying in the corners. And, but, but also rats are misunderstood, you know, rats are not, like, they don't mean to cause harm to humans. They don't really know why people dislike them so much. So I think that's why that's ultimately, even if I couldn't put it into words like that when I was writing it, I think that's why the idea of having Billy transform into a rat always stuck with me. And so that's why that became the main plot and theme of the movie. Okay, yeah, I can see some similarities there. So uh, is your movie still in production or is it getting ready to come out? Where are we at in the progress with this? No, we're, uh, we're in the final stage of post-production right now. The movie's going to be done very soon. And depending on when this interview is released, it might already be done. 
And so what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have an online premiere for Fang and, you know, everybody, you know, is welcome to watch. And after, you know, I have my online premiere, I'm going to get a distribution deal for the movie. So it's probably going to be distributed much more widely sometime in 2021. And then everybody who isn't available for the online premiere can watch it in the comfort of their homes and have the full fang experience whenever they feel like it. I like it. The full fang experience. Short That's of the great. bites. Short of the bites. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so nearly the full fang experience. Oh, yeah. Okay. Full good. fang experience minus any uh, unfortunate fur growth. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. Um, so, so that's the one movie you're, you're working on. Do you have any others in the pipeline or is that, uh, is that the one you're just focusing on right now? I do have another script that I'm working on. I like to joke that I've been almost done writing it for several months now, but now I am actually getting closer to finishing writing. The title is Broken Angels. It's a thriller and the premise is that it's about this guy is like a politician you know he's campaigning to be elected senator of florida and you know he's like a very kind of suave charismatic you know very social guy he's like he's kind of like the extreme opposite of how an autistic person would act if they were on stage but the twist is that he has this you know double life where he's kind of this sadistic predatory criminal and so the protagonists have to kind of prove that he's committing all these horrible crimes and and hurting people but he's so good at getting people on his side he's so good at manipulating people that he keeps getting away with it and so they have to bring him down by whatever means possible all right very cool thank so, you excellent and uh, what's the uh, what's the name of your film company? Well, I, I don't have my own uh, company. I hopefully I'll have one in the near future. For now, I'm just Richard Bergen, writer, director, and in the future, company owner would look good on my website as well. <laughs> yes, it would. That that always uh, adds a little more credibility. That's straight. <laughs> All right. So very good. And so your anticipated release for Fang is sometime in twenty twenty early twenty twenty one. That's right. Yeah, well, it, we could possibly have the premiere in late December of 2020, but I think for most people, it's probably they're probably going to watch it in 2021, I would say. Okay, fair enough. That sounds very good. Well, Richard, I appreciate you coming on to Focused on Forward today. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you, and I appreciate you being open and frank with us about uh, uh, Asperger's and, and how that's affected you both in uh, at some stages, a negative way, but really you can see the positives of how you've made this and you have chose to be focused on moving forward. So thank you so much. You're, you've been a fun guest to have. Uh, you're very welcome, Tim. Thank you again for having me on your show. And I hope everybody who's listening to this gets a chance to watch Fang. And I hope you all have a fantastic time watching it. There you go. Excellent. <laughs> and uh, we'll make sure to include some links in the bottom. Uh, once you have those, send them to us and we'll, we'll put them in the description of this show so they can make sure that they have access. Absolutely. To it. Thank you so All right. much. All right, guys, I think that's going to conclude us today for Focused on Forward. Well, that concludes another episode of Focused on Forward. To be a guest of Focused on Forward, you can reach us through Twitter at podcast FOF through our Facebook page named Focused on Forward, or through email, focusedonforward at gmail.com. We look forward to hearing each and every one of your stories that has yet to be told. So until then, be safe, be kind, and be loving to one another as you stay focused on forward. <laughs>